All right. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about here is, as I mentioned, kind of the theory for calculating effective material properties. And the material properties that I'm going to be focusing on here specifically are the ones that can be computed in the Puma GUI. Um, there are more advanced material properties, including anisotropy and permeability. So anisotropic heat transfer, um, anisotropic elasticity, material orientation, and uh, permeability. Um, these are going to be in, uh, discussed later by uh, Federico. So um, those four aspects won't be discussed here because they can't be they cannot be uh, computed in the GUI itself. Um, so we've we've talked a lot. I just want to briefly tie it into what Naji was talking about with volume averaging. So hopefully that gave you just a little bit of a taste of what the equations look like at the micro macro scale for volume average modeling and why it's important to have uh, micro scale derived material properties in order to inform those macro scale models. And once again, um, we're assuming for the purposes of this that you've already generated your tomography samples and that you've already gone through the process of doing the processing and segmentation. So what I'm going to be talking about here is assuming your material is already in a state that is either already segmented or can be easily thresholded. Um, uh, and then properties are going to be run based on that. So the properties I'm going to talk about specifically, um, first is uh, porosity and volume fractions, uh, which of, of course is, is the easiest of them. Um, next is surface area, and then uh, effective thermal and electrical conductivity, continuum, tortuosity, and then uh, rarefied or non-continuum tortuosity as well. So starting with volume fractions and porosities, um, th there's really no theory here at all. Once your image is segmented, um, you've already basically computed your volume fractions. You just go and tally up all the number of voxels in your domain that are of each identifier, and that gives you your volume fractions. In the next section, I'll show you how to actually do that calculation in Puma. But in terms of theory, um, beyond just the theory of doing the segmentation, there's there's really nothing um, there's really nothing here. Uh, surface area is um, surface area is is a little bit more complicated, but still fairly straightforward. Um, I'll try to keep my philosophizing about surface area to a minimum. I like to monologue about how surface area is actually a lot more complicated than it seems, but I think Francesco will will kill me if I do that. But um, I'll, I'll just make a couple points here about how to discretize your surface or how to represent your surface and what that means for calculating surface area. So in the kind of most naive way to calculate surface area, you can take a voxel grid, which you see here at the bottom, and basically just go count up all the exposed faces. And um, you could be forgiven for thinking that as you expand your size, you say, okay, well, this creates a lot of error, but if we make uh, if our domain size is, is appropriately big and the features are very well resolved, that eventually maybe this averages out, but it, it turns out to not. So in the example of uh, just a circle that we have here, and you want to calculate the, um, uh, the circumference of the circle, um, you know, the 2D analog to the surface area, then uh, if you use this voxel-based grid, you go and you count up all your little uh, exposed faces and even as your number of voxels that are contained in your circle goes up to infinity, um, what you end up with is a projection of basically that, that flat surface out to the edges. So your predicted circumference um, as your size goes to infinity becomes four times your diameter, which uh, of course is, is you know, off by a, a factor of four over pi from the true circumference. Um, in 3D, it's it's very similar. You have uh, your true surface area is four pi r squared. If you were to uh, calculate it using this voxel grid, you project it out. Um, you end up with a predicted surface area of six pi r squared. So you end up with an error of about 50%. So what we use instead is is something called the marching cubes, which is just one of of many different um, isosurface triangulation techniques. 
Uh, the marching cubes I mentioned a little bit earlier, but basically you go into each voxel, you determine does my surface cut through this voxel or not? And if it does, you try to figure out how to best represent that using triangles. And um, in this case, uh, you, you can end up with a very, very nice, very clean surface mesh from this. I should also quickly mention that there are two different um, types of surface area that we're talking about here. There's just the raw value for surface area, which would be in meters squared, but the more applicable property is the specific surface area, which is kind of the more intrinsic property to the material, which is your surface area per unit volume. So you end up with the units of, um, of uh, one over meters. So tying back into our discussion about running things on segmented versus unsegmented tomography, uh, if you run, uh, this is just a, a sphere of radius 20, and we can compare the exact value um, analytically to the unseg uh, unsegmented marching cube surface area. We end up with a very small percent error that as your radius increases, converges to zero. And then if you do it on a segmented image, like you see here on the right, you end up with about 8% error, and that, that actually really does not go down. Um, that's It would converge to some significant non-zero error as your radius increases. Now, you can cheat a little bit and do the blur that I was talking about earlier, which is an option that you can select inside of the surface area calculation if you are running on a segmented image. And then you end up with, in this particular case, about a 0.6% error. So not bad, but... Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit more error than unsegmented. Now, one um, thing that, that complicates this a little bit, if you're talking about a multi-phase material and you've got different material phases in here, then uh, you have to be careful by what you mean by surface area. Uh, do you mean the area of a specific phase exposed to the void? Do you count the area in between phases? Do you look at all of the phases exposed to the void? So there's a discussion in the tutorial on multi-phase modeling in Python that talks about the appropriate way to calculate the various different definitions you might mean by surface area for a multi-phase um, for a multi-phase material. Uh, so next is uh, effective thermal conductivity. And um, the effective thermal conductivity is uh, you take your porous material and you want to know on a volume average sense uh, what is the effective conductivity of this thing such that I can plug it into my macro scale model. Now, a couple physically important things to talk about here. Um, number one is you need to know what your dominant mode of heat transfer is. So in particular, if you get to really, really high temperatures like we're interested in for heat shield materials, then you start to have to worry about um, you start to, to have to worry about radiative heat transfer. Um, in this section here, we're not talking about radiative heat transfer. We're just talking about conductivity. Uh, next, you have to talk about your constituent properties. So, for example, for a highly porous material like you see here on the right, if you have air versus some other gas, uh, it ends up changing pretty significantly. It can the um, effective thermal conductivity of the overall material. So if it's a vacuum, for example, versus uh, in air, it, it can actually have a pretty meaningful difference in the overall thermal conductivity of the material. So the, what gas you're using cannot be neglected here. Uh, and then finally, is your material isotropic or anisotropic? And uh, Federico later is going to talk about anisotropy and how we handle that. And then finally, of course, what's important is the microstructure of the material, which is which is why we're here. Presumably, we have micro CT data of this microstructure, and we want to use that to then compute our material properties. So for the remaining section, I'm going to assume radiation is not important, and we're going to talk about isotropic heat transfer. So then beyond what's physically important, now we have to ask what's numerically important. So numerically important is, um, number one, choice of numerical method, and then the, the order of accuracy of this, of this choice. So we have to understand what the numerics that we're solving here is. Uh, next is how we're representing the surface in this numerical method is, is of course important. Choice of boundary conditions. And then uh, finally, which is, is a point I really wanna emphasize, is your microstructure sample representative? So you have to, in order to have confidence about the properties that we're calculating, 
it's really important to make sure that the sample size that you're running this on is sufficiently large and your material is sufficiently homogeneous at that scale that the sample is representative of the overall material. And the way we typically define this, the way we like to think about it, is if we take multiple samples, um, and, and quite often we, we actually literally do, take multiple samples of tomography from the same material at different points, and for a given size, we compute uh, the material property on various different of these samples. And then we look at the standard deviation of that property and assign some arbitrary threat cutoff of one or 2% to say that, okay, once the standard deviation has dropped to one to 2% of the mean value, then we'll say, okay, this is a representative size. And importantly, it's a representative size for this particular volume, uh, for this particular material property. So a representative volume for thermal conductivity is going to be different than a representative volume for porosity, for example. Now, finally, okay, what, what are the actual equations that we're solving here and, and how do we solve these equations? So the first equation is pretty much the last equation that Najee had in, in his slides. And it's, it's just a Fourier's law on an averaged quantity. So you have your average heat flux, your effective uh, thermal conductivity tensor, and your average gradient of your average temperature. And uh, if we drop our averages for simplicity here, you just end up with, with Fourier's law of, of heat conduction. So Q being our heat flux, K being our effective thermal conductivity, and then grad T, of course, being our temperature gradient. So the way we actually compute this property in Puma is we impose a temperature gradient on one side. So Sometimes we use Dirichlet boundary conditions, sometimes we use periodic boundary conditions with an addition. And you impose this gradient, and then you solve your steady state heat equation uh, such that you end up with a steady state temperature profile like something you see here on the right. And you would use that to then compute your uh, overall heat flux. So you compute your heat flux Q from this steady state temperature. You've imposed your temperature gradient T, so that only leaves K, and then you can just directly solve for what your effective thermal conductivity is. And typically, if this is in three dimensions, then you would need to run this in 3D. So uh, in, run this in three different simulations. So you impose a temperature gradient in X, you then impose a temperature gradient in Y, impose a temperature gradient in, in Z, run the simulation for each of these, and then you end up with your effective thermal conductivity tensor. So um, I just want to briefly introduce the two solvers that we use to do this in the isotropic solvers. So we're solving, of course, just the steady heat equation with variable conductivity. We're imposing two different conditions at the interface between different materials. So between different materials and actually between at, at every boundary of every voxel, we're ensuring that the temperature is continuous at the boundary and that the heat flux is continuous at the boundary. And then in 1D, you go through the finite volume discretization process on a uniform Cartesian grid. You end up with the 1D discrete equation down here. Um, and you can just imagine in 3D, it just, it just naturally flows from that. This then becomes a, just a large linear system, AX equals B. You solve, uh, B usually contains the information about your boundary conditions. You solve for X using an iterative solver conjugate gradient, pick G stab are the two options that we have, I think, in the GUI. And then um, uh, from that, um, you then produce your steady state temperature. Now, uh, I, I just want to briefly mention as well that we have implemented a second solver, which is called the explicit jump solver, um, which uh, was published by uh, Wegman um, who, who is the, the primary author of uh, the Geodict software, which is a commercial software that's um, quite similar to Puma and its functionalities. And uh, it's a very, very fast solver that uses FFTs. And um, if you have periodic boundary conditions, it's considerably faster than the kind of naive way of doing the finite volume solver with this large AX equals B system. So if periodic boundary conditions work for you, the explicit jump solver is, is very, very fast. So finally, I want to talk about tortuosity. So tortuosity is a material's resistance to diffusion. So uh, the diffusion equation actually ends up being the exact same as the heat equation. So if you're operating in the continuum, um, you know, as defined by your Newton number, then you can 
you run a continuum tortuosity simulation in very much the same way that you would run a effective thermal conductivity simulation. You impose a concentration gradient, you drive that to steady state, you look at your steady state mass flux, and from that you can back out what your um, what your tortuosity value is. So if your material has no resistance to diffusion whatsoever, that would be a tortuosity value of one. And it only goes up from there. So one is kind of the minimum value, meaning it's a straight path to tortuosity. And then anything higher than one indicates that you're being impeded by basically that factor. So it's just an impedance factor on your diffusion coefficient. So that works well in the continuum. Uh, Non-continuum, I, I won't go too much into the theory here. I, I just want to quickly mention that we, we just published a paper on the theory here and, and the, the simulations. Um, uh, the, there's a, a link to the, or a, a reference to the paper here on the slide. But the important point I want to I make is that when you're outside of the continuum, the diffusion behavior inside your material you cannot describe it anymore just by a single impedance factor. So you can't just say, okay, what is my diffusion coefficient without any material here? And then um, uh, what, is my, um, uh, what is my impedance factor on that? And then you get your new effective diffusion coefficient. And in particular, as you go up in rarefied all the way to say free molecular, you end up with a uh, diffusion coefficient, a reference diffusion coefficient that is not really coherent, right? If you if you have particles that don't collide with each other at all, it's not really physically valid to even have a reference diffusion coefficient in that setting. So you have to define your reference diffusion coefficient a little bit differently. And um, in particular, what we end up with is a length scale and a tortuosity factor that then describes what the diffusion behavior is inside of a material and lets you then compute your effective diffusion coefficient for a variety of different conditions. So uh, we use particle methods for this because the continuum equations aren't valid anymore um, if we're outside of the continuum. And for more theory, either reach out to me directly or read this paper. And then if you have any other questions, uh, reach out to me directly. And that is it for the, uh, the theory. So I'll stop here quickly and just see if anyone has any questions before moving on to doing some of these basic calculations. Uh, can we put the name of that paper in the chat? Yes. I can I can do that. Uh, you, right. you want to set up yourself or okay. Um perfect. So then in that case, I will go ahead and um start uh start just doing a, a demonstration of some of this. So let me pull up desktop. I'm going to use the same two samples as well as some generated materials in order to demonstrate how to do these calculations. So uh, the first thing, open up a terminal. Again, con to activate Puma. You can see I already have Puma activated here. So now just type in Puma GUI. Uh, the GUI appears. And uh, we're just going to drag in a example of a fiber form, this, this fibrous material here that we've been using for some of the other examples. So I'm gonna show for these calculations, typically how you would do it on an unsegmented image. And then I'm gonna quickly switch over to the segmented image and show how to do it there as well. Um, if you have any questions, you don't understand what I'm doing, uh, please put it in the chat or just feel free to unmute and, and interrupt me. Um, first thing, just the most basic properties of volume fractions and uh, surface area. So volume fractions, we're going to, uh, we have uh, an option to compute porosity or volume fraction. It's, it's the same thing. So I'm just going to click on volume fraction. And what it wants to know is it wants to know the grayscale range for your phase of interest. 
So if I'm interested in the porosity, that means I'm interested in the void phase. So the void phase for this particular image, as we mentioned before, is 0 to 89. I say begin calculation, and you can see that we have a porosity of 0 0.79. Uh, if we wanted to calculate the volume fraction of the solid phase, we could do 90 to 255, begin calculation, and uh, 0 0.21, which of course is just one minus the porosity since it's just a two-phase material. So to do that on a segmented image is exactly the same thing, except that now um, our domain, since it's segmented, we're just talking about zeros and ones. So the void range is just zero to zero. Begin calculation, we end up with the exact same 0 0.79. If we were to do one and one, then we end up with this calculation of 0 0.21. We'll go back to the unsegmented. Uh, unless anyone has any questions, I will move on to surface area. The, the volume fractions are really, uh, really very simple. So when you open up the GUI um, window, oh, today I, I thought I heard something. No, okay. Uh, when you open up the GUI window for the surface area, um, you end up with uh, have being able to choose the surface representation, as I mentioned earlier, either the voxel based or the marching cubes. We're going to leave it at marching cubes for now. And then you choose the grayscale range of the void phase. So um, the void phase in this case would be 0 to 89. We say begin calculation. And it gives us the raw surface area and the specific surface area. Now, it's really important here before you calculate this property that you got to make sure your voxel length is set correctly so, because that will impact the values out here. So, um, for example, 1.3 E minus six is what is, um, uh, is appropriate for this material. So now we have the correct value for the raw surface area as well as the specific surface area. So if we were to repeat, if we were to repeat this process on a segmented image, then we have zero to zero for the boundary, right? Because now the void phase is just black. So it's just zero. And uh, if we were to say begin calculation for reference, the unsegmented image gave us this four zero, so 40,000 is basically the value for a specific surface area. And you can see that when we do it on segmented image, we're off by about 7%. However, if we click this interpolate vertices, what it's doing is it's, it's doing that blurring effect that I was talking about before. And it just kind of smooths out the surface. And if we check that and then say begin calculation, we end up with uh, just below 40,000, but it's, it's much closer to the value of the unsegmented image. So if you're forced to work on segmented images, then this interpolate vertices option to create that blur, um, which is, is, this is just a mean filter of uh, size one that will help, um, so one in each direction, that will help to uh, produce a, a better calculation for your effective surface area. So um, moving on now to tortuosity, I'm actually going to create a fiber structure to run the tortuosity on. Uh, for the purposes of speed in this, I'm going to do it um, 100 cubed with an average length of 100. And I'll just do a quick 3D rendering to show you what that looks like. So we just have this little structure here. Uh, I mean, of course, it goes without saying that for any kind of production simulation, this is not large enough. This is not going to be a representative volume of the overall material. But um, we're going to uh, uh, we're going to run it on this this uh, anyway, just because it'll be able to run in the time of these uh, simulate uh, in the time of the tutorial. So um, if we open up. Uh, let's see, material properties, tortuosity, tortuosity continuum. You've got a couple options. You can choose what solver you want to use. And I'll mention again that 
we're going to be going through this pretty quickly in this tutorial, but um, we will at the same time we're uploading these videos, we're also going to upload some already recorded videos that uh, for each of these properties go into um, much more depth. I think each one is about 10 minutes long compared to the 15 minutes that we have for, for all of this in this tutorial. But a couple different properties. Uh, we have the explicit jump, which uses periodic boundary conditions. Um, we need to uh, choose the grayscale range of the void because we want to solve for diffusion in the void phase, which for this generated material is 0 to 127. We're going to choose what directions we solve in. I'm just going to say X for now. We choose the accuracy of the solver. Uh, so it's an iterative solver. It will keep going until the residual falls below a certain amount. Uh, I'm going to say 1 e to the minus 4 as a pretty reasonable value for the accuracy for most kind of engineering applications. Maximum number of iterations. So it, if the accuracy is not reached within 10,000 iterations, then it'll stop. And then uh, how many CPUs you want to use. So this is parallelized using, using OpenMP. And if you set this to be zero, then it will um, just go in and figure out what the maximum number of CPUs that you have available is, and it'll run on those CPUs. So say begin calculation. Um, it will show you the iterations. You can see that the explicit jump solver converges extremely quickly, only about 30 iterations. Uh, and you can see that we have a tortuosity value of about 1.2, which means that we have roughly a 20% impedance on the uh, diffusion coefficient inside of the material as compared to the bulk diffusion coefficient outside of the material. So we're going to repeat that for the finite volume solver. We get to choose our boundary conditions. We're going to say periodic on the side directions. And then in the simulation directions, it's going to impose Dirichlet boundary conditions. So in the direction of the simulation, which is the x direction, we have a concentration of 0 and 1. And then in the side directions, the other four sides of the cube, we're going to have periodic boundary conditions. Same thing for low cutoff, high cutoff for the void phase. Same thing for direction, accuracy, iterations, et cetera. We'll begin the calculation on this. You can see that it's still pretty quick, but it, it takes considerably more iterations to converge than the explicit jump solver does. So the only reason you would want to use this is if periodic boundary conditions, which it's quite often the case that periodic boundary conditions are not appropriate. Um, in particular, for most tomography samples, of course, your material is not going to be periodic. So symmetric boundary conditions are, are usually a more appropriate choice, which is an option here uh, reflected. Symmetric is the same thing. But you can see we have, um, using this numerical method, produced a tortuosity of uh, 1.187, 1.19. So even though we're running on a very small sample size, it's very close to what we were getting from the explicit jump solver. And if you're running on a much bigger size, then you would expect these values to be uh, basically exactly the same. Uh, I know I'm moving quickly, but are there any questions before I move on to the particle-based tortuosity method? Okay. Maybe you can show, Joseph, maybe you can show, uh, I don't know if this is the appropriate place, but like the, uh, the diffusion map. Um, by diffusion map, you mean like uh, the concentration? Yeah, the concentration, concentration field, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show that for the thermal conductivity because it's the same thing. Yeah. So uh, we'll move on quickly to the particle-based tortuosity method. And um, I there really is not time in this context to go through all of the details of the particle-based solver. As I mentioned, there will be a separate video released that goes through this. It's also kind of an esoteric thing. So this is probably not really appropriate to most of your applications that you're interested in, unless it's for some reason, high temperature, or low pressure that you're outside of the continuum inside of your material, which is sometimes the case. But I'll show just a quick uh, simulation using um, a quick simulation in the continuum regime, actually. And then I'll point you to the paper, which uh, Federico, uh, sorry, Francesco linked in the chat if you're interested in rarefied simulations. Uh, 
So we can actually do continuum simulations with um, the particle method if you want to. So in this case, the solver options were choosing the grayscale range of the void phase, also 0 to 127. The number of particles, uh, 1,000 is extremely small, but I just went ahead and put it to this so that it'll run very quickly for the, the video. But typical production simulations, we run about 100,000 or a million uh, particles. Total walk length is how long each of these particles is going to travel um, in voxels. This is basically the simulation time. Uh, mean free path will determine basically if you're in the continuum or outside of the continuum. So I'm putting this in voxels. And again, so you have to make sure your voxel length is set appropriately. Um, I'm setting this to be, uh, it would be 1.3 uh, um, uh, micrometers. Mean thermal velocity in meters per second. Uh, random seed uh, just determines uh, for repeatability, you can set the same random seed. Number of threads, uh, if you set it to zero, it defaults to max. And then finally, collision method, which is, are we gonna use the marching cubes or are we gonna use the actual voxel grid surface in order to do the uh, in order to do the collisions between the particles and the surfaces? I'm gonna leave that to isosurface. I'm say begin calculation. And it should take uh, 30 seconds maybe for this thing to run. Are you writing, yeah, are you writing iterations in the, in the terminal, right? So uh, you can see here now it's plotting, um, it's running the random walks and it's plotting the mean square displacement as a function of time. And the mean square displacement is what is used to calculate the, uh, the tortuosity value and the effective diffusion coefficient. But you, you can actually see for the x direction in the continuum solvers, we were getting 1.2. And here in the particle method, we're actually also getting 1.2. So there should be very good agreement between the particle method and the continuum solver if you run with a uh, you know, large enough uh, number of particles and, and so on. So I, I know there wasn't too much detail on the random walk simulation here. Um, again, I would refer you to the paper uh, or to the more detailed tutorial video that's going to come out in conjunction with, uh, with the, the video for this workshop. And then the last material property I want to mention, which is probably of interest to a lot more of you, is the thermal conductivity. So thermal conductivity, a lot of the parameters are going to be very, very similar to what you saw with, um, to what you saw with the um, uh, continuum-based uh, uh, continuum based tortuosity solvers. So you can use the explicit jump or the finite volume. The explicit jump gives you uh, a faster convergence, but you've got less control over your boundary conditions. In the GUI, we've let you set up up to six different materials. Uh, if you need more than this, then you can uh, run it from either PumaPy or you can run the C++ code directly and you can use as many different materials as you want. If you want to activate new materials, you just check this box and then you put in the grayscale ranges of that material. So in this case, we're running from 0 to 127 for our artificially generated material here. So we're saying that the void phase has a thermal conductivity of 0 0.0257, which is just the thermal conductivity of air at standard uh, temperature and pressure. And then we're going to say the solid phase, which is 128 to 255, that has a constituent thermal conductivity of 12, which is in the ballpark of what a carbon fiber would be. Um, we're going to set our simulation direction. We'll just say X once again. And then uh, 100,000 iterations maximum, number of threads zero, set the accuracy. Now we'll begin the calculation. The simulation result is going to show down here. And uh, you'll notice that in this case, um, it's not going to be just X, Y, and Z. It's, it's, a, it's a tensor value. So what this, uh, this means is that if you impose a temperature gradient in the X direction, what is the heat flux in the X direction? Uh, what the X, Y component means is if you impose a temperature gradient in the X direction, what is the um, heat flux in the Y direction? So it's, it's possible that you could have um, values for the off diagonals that are actually quite substantial, depending on the microstructure of your material. 
So the last thing I want to mention is that you can output the temperature fields. So I'll show an example of that now. If you take your temperature field, uh, we'll output it as a VTK format. So this is the steady state temperature profile. And I'm just going to save it in my desktop. And then I will import that into pair view so that you can see what that looks like. Um, So here, Paraview, I mean, you can use whatever visualization tool that you want. Paraview just happens to be my favorite. Uh, you say, uh, let's see, where did I save it? I saved it right here, temperature uh, tx.vtk. Drag that in. Change the solid color representation to the Puma matrix, which is the temperature. And we can change it to surface, for example. And now you can see, and you, you could create slices through this if you want you can see what the steady state temperature field looks like for the explicit jump solver um, of the thermal conductivity with the, uh, with the inputs that you put for, uh, for the simulation. So with that, that wraps up this section. Um, Federico is going to go into more details on, of course, Puma Pi, but also some of the more advanced material properties like the permeability, for example. And um, uh, with that, I'll open it up. If anyone has any questions, uh, please either put it in the chat or, um, or just speak up.